Bible with me this morning to Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at just one verse in verse 20. We've spent some time in Mark's gospel, and we're just going to take a one Sunday break as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper this morning. I want us to look together at a single verse in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And our sermon this morning is entitled, An Invitation to the Lord's Supper. I get excited for many things, but an invitation to a good meal? You know I'm going to get excited. I like to invite myself. I like to put it in my, in my calendar and invite myself to the fellowship dinner every second Sunday of the month because it just gives me something to get excited about with all that fried chicken. Whew. I'm just getting excited thinking about it. And today I want to invite you, if you have not already bought you a pulled pork plate, you come and, in, and here's your invitation to a delicious meal in the fellowship hall where we're going to have some pulled pork to follow. So come and be a part of that and support our youth in doing so. But last night I actually, um, it just, you know, the, the theme here is I, I kind of keep inviting myself to stuff. And last night I was having a conversation with Brother Cliff in which we were talking, you know, I'm, I'm from Meridian. I, I've got the city boy mindset. You know, there's a lot of things that I haven't experienced in good country living. And I asked Cliff an important question. I've asked lots of people in order to find exactly what I'm looking for. And I said, Cliff, you ever cook possum? And I said, Cliff, how do you cook your possum? Tell, tell me all about it. Give, give, me all, give me all the understandings because I've heard about this and I don't know if I really want to try it or not, but I really want to try it because I'm interested in something like this. And he's telling me all about this possum, and I'm, I'm tuning some of the stuff out because I don't want to hear that part. Uh, he did tell me about the spices he's going to put it in and how spicy it's going to be. And I said, Cliff, here's what you need to do. You need to invite me over to your house and cook me some possum. And here's what we'll do. You know, it, it's, it's getting to where when Clay's not in the room, I talk about him. What you're going to do is You're going to invite me over. You're going to invite Kyle over because Kyle said he would try it too. And you need to invite Clay over. That way we can make fun of Clay because he's not going to try it. Oh, oh, I just knew that was Clay coming through. Had something to add in. No, I get excited for an invitation. And Jesus himself gives us an invitation to a dinner. And this morning, I want to read each of you that very invitation. Not of a meal of possum or a meal of fried chicken, but of the greatest of meals, not for its nutritional value, but for its spiritual and theological significance. And so if you would stand with me this morning as we consult God's word, and in it we find an invitation to his supper. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Hear now the words of the living and true God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who chases after us. Even when we are far off from you, even when we reject you and don't know you, Lord, still you knock that we might open the door for you. Lord, I pray this morning as we gather as your church, Lord, we know that there are those here this morning who need to make decisions of faith. Lord, those who are here this morning who might need to take you a little bit more seriously. Those here this morning who may not know you even in the slightest. Lord, this morning we ask that you would knock upon our heart's doors that we might invite you in. Lord, I pray this morning as the gospel is presented and as we consider you in your word, that you would change our hearts and our minds and that we would accept you as Christ and Lord over all. Lord, we thank you for this time we'll spend together, and we ask that you would develop us by your word, that we might be your own people sent out for your purposes. Lord, we thank you for this time, and we ask it in your son Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. My mom really scared us growing up. She said, I'm going to leave this house. I'm just running up here to the convenience store. If anybody knocks on the door, I don't care if it's somebody you know, you don't open it. And we took this very, very seriously. So seriously that we began to get a little worried that when we looked at that peephole, could they see us back? And so we had this whole thing. When somebody would knock on the door, we would be like on top of each other, looking out the one window to see who it was. And we wasn't opening the door. 
we, we, were, we were paranoid and panicked. And if it was up to us to open the door, my, even if mama was home, it got to the point, mama, you're going to have to open the door. We don't know who that is. They might get us. So mama was the one to open the door. And Jesus here begins his invitation to us with a very similar thing, this understanding of a door. And on one side is Jesus, and then on the other side are we. And here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, this is how Jesus begins it. Behold, that word in both the Old and the New Testament is look, check it out. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. An illustration that's that's very easy to understand. An illustration of someone who knocks upon the door wants to come in. And Jesus here is telling us that he knocks upon the door. And this door here, Revelation is a very symbolic and figurative letter written to us that we might understand many of the things both of this life and of the end times and the life to come. And this door that Jesus speaks of here is like unto the door of our hearts. The one place Jesus wants to be is within us within our heart, known by us on the seat of our heart's throne that He might be Lord over us. This is where He seeks to go. For at the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, what happened? But He walked freely with us in relationship with us. And guess what? Man rejected Him and ran from Him. Ever since the very beginning, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, in the very third chapter, Jesus has been seeking out his people, and calling them, asking that they might return to him. And here Jesus gives this to us in this symbol of the knock upon the door. And this happens to every single one of us. I'm of the belief based on what the Bible says and of Jesus' sacrifice that there is no one whose heart's door will never be knocked on. From the most remote tribe in the forest village of a land we do not know, all the way to the children, to the oldest amongst us, to the people who are the furthest from Jesus, everyone is approached by Jesus at least one time in their life. Many of us are approached multiple times that He would knock upon our heart's door. And this might be confusing to us because we might say, well, Brother Taylor, the Bible tells me that this will happen, but but what's it like? Many times as the, as the pastor, you see things a little bit differently from way up here. What it's like is when truth is read from God's word and it strikes us to our very core. What it's like is when we recognize that Jesus is present amongst us and all we can do is but hold back tears. What it's like is a little whisper inside of us, a nudge on our back from a supernatural force that says, you need to respond. You need to do what that preacher just explained and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It doesn't feel the same for anyone. It's not like the same thing for everyone. But this knock upon our heart's door is something that if each and every one of us were to be receptive to and knowledgeable of and and, and be... exciting and expectant that it's coming, we would, we would recognize it. And many a Christian in this room can tell you of the time that happened for them. I was seven years old at Oak Grove Baptist Church in Meridian, Mississippi. Seven. And during that time, the preacher, I have no clue what he was saying, but I remember the feeling I felt. The whole drive home from church, the whole invitation, the whole time, all the way until we got to my house, here I am, and I know I need to do something. And so I go into the bathroom at my house that I grew up in, and I accepted Jesus Christ on my knees in the bathroom at my home home house there in, in my hometown of Meridian, Mississippi. And during that... I can tell you that the the thing that I experienced was a knowledge that I needed to do something. A knowledge that Jesus was indeed knocking upon my heart's door. It's not the same for everyone, but each of us are going to experience at some time in our life an invitation, a, a knock upon the heart's door that we might respond to Jesus. And it often happens here. It often happens in the Word. 
It often happens at the end of a sermon when a decision is being made and it's asked of you, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? And it's in those questions that we have to ask, where would I? And how do I spend it with Jesus? But many of us, we get accustomed to the sound of the knocking. It happens again and again and again, and we tell the Lord, not yet. I'm not ready. I don't want to give up my sin. I don't want to live the life of a Christian every day of the week. I only want to live it on Sunday when I can wear my mask. Many of us have felt the knock upon our heart's door again and again and again and again. But let me ask you, if somebody was knocking on your door, would they stand there night and day and continue to do it over and over and over again for months and weeks and years? Jesus is patient, Second Peter tells us in order that none would perish, but that all would know Him and come into everlasting life. But I want you to know, and I've seen it firsthand, that there's those people in this world who they have had an experience with God over and over and over again, and sometimes it comes to the point where they begin to reject and they don't even hear the knocking anymore. And they never respond. Behold, He stands at the door and knocks. Would you open it for Him? Because here's the promise as we continue in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. The promise continues that if he stands at the door and knocks, there's something that will happen if we open it. It continues, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. Just like my mother's house, there's a rule that all schools, unfortunately, across the United States, that if somebody knocks on the classroom door, only the teacher opens it. That if anybody else, no child can jump up and answer the door because of who might come in. It could be an intruder. It could be someone who wants to do harm. We have to tell these things in order that the kids know the severity of a simple choice like that. It's a sad world we live in. That some of us would be hesitant to open the door. But the promise for Jesus is not one of harm, but of promise, of goodness, of grace, and of mercy. That if we would open the door for Him, here's what would happen on the other side. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that is, lets Jesus in, says, yes, Jesus, come and do what you've promised you would do. I trust you, Jesus. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to dwell in my heart. If anyone will do this, I will come in to him. Notice what it says. If who hears and opens the door? Anyone. If anyone hears and opens the door. It doesn't matter how young. It doesn't matter how old. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your sin. It doesn't matter your goodness. If anyone would open the door, if anyone would hear his voice and open the door, he would come in to them. And this is the promise here to come in to them. That when we open this door, and it is this simple, folks, that if we were to just open the door and allow Jesus to come in, He would do the supernatural and extraordinary work of salvation in our lives. How easy is it to open the door? This door is kind of tough to open. you got to put a little back muscle in it. Not for Jesus. It's easy. It's as easy as opening the door. I've had children who have come into my office and they have said, Brother Taylor, I don't know what to pray to ask Jesus to be my Savior. I said, baby, just talk to him. Talk to him and tell him that you want to be saved. And they say a prayer, Jesus, please save me. Amen. You know they're saved. You know it's that simple? That what Clay read earlier in this sermon, before before I got out here, And he read that if we would confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, what will happen? We will be saved. It's that easy. It's that simple. And we might say, but you have to understand all of these things. No, you don't. Not as a seven-year-old. You know what you have to understand? Jesus said, let them come unto me as a child. Prohibit not the children to come to me. You have to understand that Jesus can save you and nobody else can. You have to understand that you need saving, that there's sin in your life, and he's the only one who can do it. And then, it's as simple as opening the door. You call out to Him. 
Anybody can do it. It's that simple. And then he says, I will come in to him. The reception of Jesus into one's life is that Jesus comes and stands in their place. It's what we've just seen in baptism this morning. As Anthony and Krista stood here this morning, they stood both as themselves and also as Christ. For when they went under the waters, they were buried as Christ was buried, for He died in their stead. And as they rose up from the waters, they rose up, but yes, Christ brought them up, for they were reenacting the resurrection which Christ took on their behalf. When Christ comes into our life, He stands in our place. He says, of every evil thing you've done, of every wicked thing you've done, of every bad thing that you've done, I'll stand in with my perfection. But more than this, Jesus tells us throughout the Gospels, and especially in in John's Gospel, He tells us that when He leaves this earth, Christ died and resurrected and then ascended into heaven. When He left the earth, He didn't leave us, but He sent one called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes, and at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. That we don't walk along, but He is with us everywhere we would go. That He carries us along. That He perfects us until the day of Christ Jesus. This is what God is promising us. If what? Would you but open the door? Would you but let Him in? This morning, I wonder... Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know Him as He has revealed Himself to you upon the knock on your heart's door? Have you admitted that you're a sinner in need of God's grace and believe that Jesus is the only one who can grant that for you? If you've admitted that and believed that, but you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord, He's knocking even this moment that you would let Him in. It's as simple as accepting it, as opening the door. And all of this is said in order that Jesus might invite us to the moment we're about to partake. Verse 20 ends, And will dine with Him, and He with me. This morning, we're preparing to take of what is called the Lord's Supper. And this table this morning is set and ready, but only for those who know Jesus. The symbols of the supper, we're about to dine with Jesus, and He with us and us with Him, are a cup that symbolizes His blood, and bread that symbolizes His body. It symbolizes, and we remember and recognize in this supper that Jesus has died for us on the cross at Calvary. And He's died for every single one of us. But in a moment, I'm going to read a warning. There are some of us who have not accepted the blood and the body of Jesus. There are some of us who have not called on Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we do not know Him. We do not have a relationship with Him. You cannot partake of the supper until you first let Him in. This morning, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not too late to join this table. And the promise is even greater that the invitation He gives us is in the book of Revelation. And Jesus tells us both at the first supper that He institutes right before His death, and tells us again in Revelation that there's a day coming when we certainly will, not spiritually, but really, literally, sit at the table with Him and partake of this supper in paradise. I want you to be there with us when we do it. And so this morning, my invitation to you, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know Him, Today is the day that you allow Him to knock upon your heart's door, and maybe for the first time, you answer. All it requires is to recognize that you want a relationship with Jesus, a relationship that has been marred and broken by your sin, but can be restored through what Christ has done. And in knowledge of that, you simply open the door.
You simply invite him in that he might save you. And today can be that day for you. If you would make that decision this morning, I would invite you after this time of prayer to come forward that I might share with you in the joy of knowing Jesus and that we as a congregation might recognize that Jesus has done something miraculous in your life even today. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who pursues us, knocking upon the door of our heart. Even when we are far from you, even when we are maybe not ready for you, Lord, you you knock and invite us that simply, if we would open the door, that you would come in. Lord, this morning, I know that there are those who are here who need to make decisions. Lord, this morning, I ask that if they're if they're feeling your knock during this time, if, if, if they would but open the door and allow you to come in. Lord, I pray that even now you might put on their lips a prayer of salvation, that they might accept you today. We ask, Lord, that as we have this time of invitation, that you'd give them a boldness to come forward and to make a public decision to follow you. Lord, I pray that you'd be here during this time of invitation, and we ask it in your son Jesus' name. Amen.